Strong Institute at UC Berkeley. <laughs> nice. Um, we're focused on the, <laughs> the worst. I was always, I feel like I always forget. And I'm like, now it's time to do it. Um, so yeah, and so yeah, I also uh, work with other Blog Institute at UC Berkeley, similarly uh, researching climate displacement and creating a database on climate refugees around the globe. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Um, yeah, please, you're next, would you? Hi, um, my name's Faith. Um, I'm talking to you from Voice Wales, which is a journalist. Um, platform focused on mainly so social issues. Um, we don't just report on Wales, we report on um, the rest of the world as well, or we try to at least. Um, climate change is something that I've written a lot about. I mean, I don't think I have the in-depth knowledge of Anna and Andre, but like, I think I can bring a journalistic perspective, hopefully, um, especially on things like the Afghanistan crisis. Yeah, and Andre, last but not least, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Andre. I use uh, he, him pronouns, and I'm the Migrant Justice Coordinator at People and Planet, which is the UK's largest network of student organising. Um, and yeah, what else is relevant, I suppose? Um, I, yeah, I, I did my undergraduate in Oxford, where I was um, a founding member of the Roads Must Fall campaign, which where I got a lot of my campaigning experience. And then since then, I've been working with the Red Cross doing refugee support and did a master's in social and political thought, focusing on sort of theories of what progress should look like and how that fits with ideas like migration and stuff like that um and now yeah getting on with helping student groups across the country um oh no is my internet bugging there, i think my internet is my internet bugging sorry Here you are. i will move i will move quickly whilst whilst everybody else carries on hopefully you got my intro and i will hopefully be better by the time <laughs> i next um, yeah, so I just made a few minutes, but um, I guess we can get started on the first question, um, and that's just kind of an introduction of um, introductory questions. So, um, if Anna, if you would like to take this one first, it's just what is climate migration, um, and how does it differ from other forms of migration? Um, if you could specifically touch on the scale of the problem and who it affects, um, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, can do definitely. So, I think of climate-induced displacement and climate migration it really describes. This phenomena, where individuals and you know communities who are, are forcibly dis displaced, whether it be you know within borders or beyond nation-state boundaries, by both like short and long-term natural disasters, as well as environmental degradation, precipitated you know or exacerbated by the climate crisis. So short-term disasters, think of things like you know typhoons, hurricanes, wildfires, um, and then while long-term um, natural disasters and environmental degradation around desertification, you know droughts, rising temperatures, and rising sea levels, among other things. So I'm thinking about like climate refugee versus climate migrant. Refugees and migrants, you know, are entitled to the same universal protections of human rights and fundamental freedoms, which you know must be respected, protected, and fulfilled at all times. Um, however, migrants, you know, and refugees are distinct groups governed by separate, separate, excuse me, legal frameworks. So only refugees are really entitled to specific international protections as defined defined by international refugee law. So the term climate refugee, um, you know, not only accounts for Climate-induced migration, um, you know, in, in its entirety, um, but also the political nature of the climate crisis itself. Um, it's really important to, you know, make the case such that migrants can be protected under a comprehensive and legally binding framework, whether that be, you know, revising the 1951 Refugee Convention or an altogether new framework and imagining what that um, legal protection could look like for folks. So to answer your, your question about like the scale of the problem, in September of this year, the World Bank released its um, latest like groundswell report, which is the sort of latest update on projections on climate and migration. Um, and they projected that 216 million people will move in six regions around the world um, within their own boundaries and within their own countries by 2050. So it's really important to think of these sort of future projections, but we also need to remember that, you know, everyday people right now are forcibly displaced due to impacts from the climate crisis. Um, so it's really crucial to consider, you know, we're seeing, you know, as I said, right now, and it's really the poorest and most vulnerable communities um, and those who have contributed least to the climate crisis that are paying the price, um, you know, and they're hit hard hit, excuse me hardest <laughs> by the climate crisis. Um, so it's really important that we also think of these communities who are, you know, wholly, you know, dependent on the land um, and these slow climate changes like droughts and desertification are really intricately linked to economics and politics. And so this is a really intersectional issue, right? It's not just solely an environmental issue. It's really a broader human rights issue. So we can think about this from this more complex perspective and understanding this as a sort of whole system approach. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, Faith, would you like to? Yeah, so I'm um, touching about on what Anna said. Um, I think the main thing that stands out to me with climate refugees is that the cause is not always obvious. So where, when it comes to like conflict and war, um, there's usually like one event that it can be linked to. Um, but like Anna said, it doesn't necessarily have to be something like a typhoon or a hurricane. This can be something that's taking place over a series of years um, and then has a knock on effect on things like food security, and general stability. And this also links it links in with like the political stability of a country. Um, I think Afghanistan is an example that I'm probably going to use a lot tonight just because um, of the situation it's in right now with, uh, you know, with the NATO withdrawal from the country after 20 years of um, conflict and now being thrown back into the hands of the Taliban. And um, a lot of the time, Afghanistan's conflict, um, Afghanistan's climate issues kind of overlooked and it is one of the most vulnerable um, countries in the world um, it's in a climate hotspot so a lot of the time um, even though right now we're obviously associating um, Afghanistan with um, the Taliban the people there are suffering even more so from climate change um, which a lot of them are reporting um, and this is having a knock-on effect on security food security and then this can lead into even more conflicts and more instability. So it's like this almost impossible cycle to get out of. Um, and uh, yeah, just the intersectionality of it all. And um, yeah, we'll delve into it a little bit more, but I'm going to pass it on to Andre because I'm conscious of like taking up too much of the question. That was incredibly comprehensive from you two. And there's not a huge amount of gaps left. Um, I know. So hopefully, yeah, um, hopefully my internet's all right. But yeah, I'll speak. A lot of my academic interest in the Caribbean and yes, a lot of the things that people picked out there draws me to some sort of like interesting examples. So um, yeah, like like Faith was saying about how sometimes it's very imperceptible how exactly it's linked to these things and sometimes it's second order kind of things. But one thing that strikes me is particularly in the Caribbean where the economies because of years and years of this kind of neoliberalization and structural adjustment has left the economies essentially completely dependent on Western tourism. And that was borne out in things like the pandemic, where as soon as flights were closed, you had almost half the country starving because they had no, well, half the country, I'm thinking particularly of Jamaica, but of, around the whole Caribbean, people without access to a livelihood as a result of these things. And so on one side, you've got things like immediate results of climate change, like in Barbados, particularly in the Southern Caribbean, there's this huge blooming of this sargassum seaweed that's being promoted by rising sea temperatures. And that comes up on all the beaches and absolutely stinks. And so that's been massively affecting the tourism industry to the point that people can't, aren't coming to the hotels, but also means that fishermen can't get out and make their livelihood. And it means that people that work secondarily in the, in the tourist industry, taking tourists out on their boats to go and look at the dolphins or whatever, they don't have the industry there. So there's people who are going to be forced to find new, play, new livelihoods or new places to live as a result of that. And people often don't consider things like that. But also there's, thinking into the future, if we're going to build towards a just transition to a world that doesn't need fossil fuels on the level that we currently use, that will mean a huge reduction in a lot of the air travel and a lot of the, the way that the water is used in the Caribbean, the, the amount of planes that go into the Caribbean. And so there'll be huge, huge upheaval of these industries. And we need to make sure the structures in place to make sure the people displaced from that have livelihoods or are able to move to places where they're able to to make a livelihood um and that's one of the the bits that sometimes goes goes under the um radar but yeah i think i think really really important um contributions from from both of you and yeah just a little sprinkling on top but yeah brilliant. yeah no i'd agree thank you so much for all your contribution it's really comprehensive but yeah um kind of like the next question kind of ties to what you've all kind of spoken on anyways but Kind of the links between climate change and inequality so specifically looking at you know the gendered impacts that the climate crisis has but also if you want to delve into the impacts it has on vulnerable communities so um, more specifically lower income communities um yeah so if we could go anna again start. sure yeah happy to 
Yeah, I think in thinking about, you know, issues of inequality, it's definitely, you know, fundamentally an issue really of equality, equity, and justice, because the, the climate crisis, as we discussed already, really disproportionately impacts, you know, the most impoverished, marginalized, discriminated, and really disenfranchised, you know, people around the world who play very little role in causing the problem in the first place, and will pay this heavier, more disproportionate price. Um, so for instance, take the case right now, like Somalia. So right now there's a rapidly worsening drought that has left more than 2 million people um, without, you know, food and water. So they're really facing this dire situation, which has already caused more than 100,000 people to flee their homes in search of food, water, land for livestock. Um, so in recent years in Somalia, you know, which is has lots of conflict and, and war history. Natural disasters have actually been the main driver of displacement. Um, so we're seeing this sort of repeatedly throughout the region. So Somalia has seen over the past 30 years, really lots of climate related disasters around 30 since 1990. Um, so this frequency and severity of climate related hazards are only increasing. And these disasters and hazards are really impacting um, vulnerable populations the most. So impacting, you know, children, women, elderly folks, and, and disabled people who really are bearing the brunt of the humanitarian crisis. And it's really important to, to look at how these climate crisis factors um, really impact existing vulnerabilities and exacerbate those vulnerabilities. And as well as how it trends, like we already discussed, livelihoods, increases poverty, and contributes to conflict. So thinking about this again from this, this holistic framework, it's really important. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, there's several ways that I see this. Uh, there's a geographical um, divide in terms of a literal like north-south divide in terms of who's most impacted at this moment. And this is mirrored in kind of uh, deprivation levels as well and uh, likelihood of conflicts and so forth. Um, but there's also a, a gap in terms of like uh, knowledge, and, and that's not to say that the people in those areas don't have the knowledge, it's that they don't have the resources to um, take that knowledge to the next level. So a really interesting stat that I found the other day was that um, a recent analysis of published climate change papers found that nearly 30,000 looked at uh, North America and only 10,000 studies looked at um, African countries. So it's this, uh, obviously we rely on these studies to help us propel um, ourselves forward and to hopefully, uh, you know, uh, enact on climate change. And without the resources directed into the countries that need it the most, then, you know, how are they supposed to fight against climate change? Which, um, as Anna pointed out, is they're not responsible for, we're largely responsible for. Um, another way of looking at this question is in a gender context. Um, so I think I was talking to a friend earlier about this and he was like, wait, so how does this link in with, he was looking at my notes and he, he just read one note and was like, how does this link in with girls being taken out of school? But basically, um, if there's a strain in terms of resources and food insecurity, uh, girls will be pulled out of school to then work to provide for the family. Um, and it might even be the case, which is happening in Afghanistan right now, where girls are being sold off because the family literally have no food left. Um, and there's been cases of like babies being sold um, because, you know, parents can't feed the rest of their children. Um, and again, like I said before, this is because the Taliban are back in power, but it's also because of uh, climate change, which has been wrecking havoc on the country for um, a very long time. Um, I think it's also, Anna just touched upon this, but it's also important to point out that even in uh, the global north, uh, there's uh, stark inequalities in terms of um, race and class. So whether it's in the global south or global north, climate change is always going to be impacting um, the most impoverished, uh, black and people of colour, um, it's always going to hit those people the hardest, um, whether that's through polluted air and who's most exposed to polluted air, um, or, you know, lack of green spaces, uh, and which obviously counterbalances the impact of um, air pollution. And even in somewhere like Cardiff, um, which I don't know where everybody is, but if anybody is in Cardiff, if you look at a map of where the green spaces are in Cardiff, um, it's quite interesting um, to see where those are located and um, to look at where the most, uh, the highest levels of air pollution are in the schools that are most impacted by there and the children that are going to those schools. Sorry, I'll pass on now. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely spot on, both of you. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. There's loads of stuff I hadn't thought of there, uh, which was, yeah, really, really cool to hear. Um, and I suppose, yeah, my, the way I would build on it would be to sort of say that while, yeah, while climate change, yeah, does disproportionately affect all of these these groups that we've mentioned, um, I suppose, yeah, unfortunately, we are kind of by design, borders also target those exact same populations. And so the people most heavily affected by climate change and that most need to move as a response to it are those that are least able to. And so that's not only just like people with the least resources within a country and the least education within a country who are penalized by these point-based migration systems that look for skilled workers with a very Western and industrialized definition of what skilled is, but also on a national scale, if we want to be talking about places like Afghanistan, where there's huge push factors, the Afghani passport is the least powerful in the world and can get you into, I think, only 32 countries um, without um, the visa free. Um, and Pakistani passport gets you into about 36. And we've got huge swathes of Pakistan that have now crossed the threshold for what's the temperature that a the human body can survive. And similarly, the Haitian passport gets you into about 40 um, countries. And we've currently got huge um huge migration issues in in haiti with people trying to leave but also but the way that the us are dealing with them because people are having to illegally migrate they're then being treated like criminals um and met with militarized border um force on the other end and so yeah it's as you say it's a confluence of all of these issues that all um combine to affect the most marginalized um the most and it's the people that don't really need need it in the same way that are able to take flights whenever they want and go to wherever they need to escape these problems or even move within countries to have the resources to move home there was just the um the other day that the british government wrote off an entire welsh village i think didn't they? And, and just said that they're giving it over to the sea they're not going to try and do any more to um to try and mitigate against the the creep of the the sea but that's like a quite poor uh I suppose well about British land is quite a poor um, area, and those people have all had their house prices prices essentially slashed to zero overnight as a result of that government declaration. And now they don't have the resources to to go and move somewhere else. Whereas, yeah, other people that might have a, a country home in the lakes or whatever, that they're not as fussed if, if that lose if they lose that or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's it's all compounding itself, which is not great, but means we've got to be cognizant of that when we're, we're, we're trying to combat it. Brilliant. Thank you for all those contributions. And that was all very well put together by you three. Um, so we've sort of spoken about um, who will disproportionately be affected. Um, now I'd like to speak about who is disproportionately the polluters. So sort of what is the complicity of the global north in the climate crisis? And if I could pass on to you, Andre. Oh, sorry, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah, um, so um, I suppose, yeah, there's there's so many layers to this that I don't really know where to start, but I suppose from a lot of my research is into, into sort of bigger picture ideas and at, at its root, the idea of the centrality of capital and the idea that progress necessitates having a constant growth in production and a constant growth in consumption that is a very modern Euro-American idea that has been globalized and that isn't a feature of most indigenous um, epistemologies, modes of thought across the world. This idea that we need to be constantly increasing and that is it two periods of without growth is a recession that we need to panic about. Whereas we know that we're on a planet with finite resources, the idea of infinite growth is clearly not consistent with that, but it's something that we, not we, well, we as the West have like forcibly enforced on, on the rest of the world uh, without leaving any alternatives, as Thatcher famously said. Um, and also borders themselves are largely a Western conception and the borders that, we, that people currently struggle to cross were mainly drawn by the West. Um, and so I suppose that's the complicity in setting up the scene from which people are struggling um, with the migration. Um, and then again, I'll leave other, leave other gaps for people to fill in, but what we work on with the diverse borders at uh, People and Planet, uh, we're focusing on the role that the border industry plays in not only, well, a lot of the companies that contribute to bordering are big um, multi-industry uh, companies like Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems that 
not only create the push factors through their, their war mongering across the country, but war, as we know, is one of the biggest um, pollutants um, in the world. And they contribute so much to that, make huge profits of that, but then are also making huge profits from building the borders, the physical, digital and um, bureaucratic walls that keep people from um, moving to, to deal with these, these problems. Um, and I think the, the role that Western companies have in lobbying for those migration policies across the world as well is, is often quite understated. Um, and we know like Microsoft have done a huge amount of work lobbying the, the US government for um, more lax privacy laws so that they can sell their facial recognition technologies to border force. We've had um, huge um, issues, I think, I'm trying to remember which one it was. I think Airbus authored one of the papers that was crucial to the, in 2003, to um, the Frontex, the European border force expanding its budget by like threefold on the basis of the recommendations of a company that was then very likely to benefit largely from it. And we've even had like TUI, the airline has been pressurizing um, people in the Canary Islands to stop sheltering and supporting migrants that arrive on boat on boats because it's impacting the, um, how they can sell it as a tourist paradise kind of thing. And so these, these lobbying efforts on the part of private um, companies um, is, is a really huge factor that's often uh, understated. Um, and I know that that's more, I've spoken more about the, the role that the West has in bordering and preventing people from dealing with climate change than actually climate change. So I don't know if anybody else can fill that in a little bit more, um, but yeah, I hope that was useful. Um, would Faith or Anna, would you like to talk more about that or? Um, um, yeah, I, I don't mind jumping in if that's okay with Anna. Um, yeah, so I was just going to talk about kind of responsibility. Um, so Global North are responsible for 92% of excess global CO2 emissions, US being responsible for 40%, EU for 29%. Um, yeah, there's, when it comes to climate change, especially as we've seen in COP26, there's like this messaging that uh, we're all responsible when it's just not the case at all. Um, this is something that Andre um, touched upon, but like in terms of broader ideas, like mass consumerism, capitalism, fast fashion, all of these ideas, which we're kind of like, we're, we, we're not allowing the global South and other countries to kind of indulge in these kind of lifestyles, but we're, we've got no intention of stopping them. So it's like, oh, I, we can't have climate justice until we have social justice and uh, we have racial justice as well. And I just like to digress a little bit and talk about the, our role in conflicts in countries, because as Andre said, this links in massively with um, pollution and it's not uh, something that is often linked, but uh, war generates huge amounts of CO2. Um, there might be the actual deliberate bombing of like water plants or waste plants, which then um, ensues chaos in terms of, um, you know, waste systems not being able to function properly, lack of clean water. Um, I think Syria had, most of the country had access to clean water prior to um, the war there. And now, you know, I don't have the stats to hand, I'm afraid, but, you know, vast swaths of people don't have access to clean water anymore and that's directly linked to the war and um you know the bombing of water plants and this is something that's happening in palestine as well in gaza um so recently there was uh the targeting of water plants where sewage was running through the main streets in gaza um and like you know we can't be engaging in conflicts abroad and we can't be arming certain uh countries like Saudi Arabia and Israel and then uh, talking about climate change and climate justice because uh, they're, they're not separate silos they're linked um, and yeah sorry I'm digressing a little bit but uh, I think one thing I wanted to touch upon as well was uh, the kind of an interesting stat that I've got here is uh, so the Afghan lifestyle takes 0.2 tons of CO2 a year. Uh, the average US lifestyle takes 15 tons. 
um, yeah, when you look at the disproportionate impact that they're experiencing on their lifestyles day to day and what we're experiencing or the West are experiencing, yeah, it's just uh, completely unfair that we respond to this then with like the greenwashing that we've seen in COP26, which was, um, yeah, just a, a sham reading. Thank you for that. And um, Anna, do you, would you like to contribute? Sure, yeah, I'll be brief. Yeah, I think in, in circling back to really thinking about like sort of militarized um, borders and the role of the global north in that way, I think that the world we really needs some sort of global government governance system that really acknowledges the devastating impact of the climate crisis on migration patterns, and then, you know, in turn provides necessary protections to climate refugees, right? So. Currently, we know that no nation offers like asylum or any other form of legal protection for people displaced by climate change. There's been some examples of countries trying. So say New Zealand, they had like a humanitarian visa that would apply for protections for climate induced migrants. But so far, we haven't seen any countries really solidify legal protection. And this is really, we know that this is a growing problem, right? So increased protections are really key here. So we could take, for example, like the free protocol agreements of Africa. So like the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, um, can serve as like a protocol type for what we can imagine this international agreement could look like um, for responding to you know the how to take in refugees and what that could look like so um, that that case in particular um, those agreements really support the free movement of people between states um, and there's already this framework to really address the, the protection gap of climate induced people by permitting entry and you know stay and receiving states and allowing access to land and um, livelihoods and stuff of that sort as well as financial assistance so this approach could really is an example of what it could look like to, to protect human security on a regional and global scale rather than focusing on you know narrowly like national security on war or like, well, how can we accrue the more, most resources? So thinking about what these other agreements could look like where we're thinking on a regional sort of global scale. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so sort of following from that, we've, spoke, we've spoken about how Western ideas and sort of ideas of militarism have contributed to the climate crisis and it affects people disproportionately. Um, so sort of what needs to be done um, what is the role of the global north in approaching this climate crisis um would it be okay if i started with you faith yeah it's fine um i think i'm gonna talk more uh ideologically uh about this um but i think that the recent cop 26 conference was a perfect example of everything that's wrong with the current approach um, I'm sure this is something that most people have read because it's been in the news a lot, but uh, there were more delegates associated with the fossil fuel industry than from any single country at COP26. Um, so there were around 503 people at the conference which had links to fossil fuel interests. And I think this just indicates this general lack of willpower and desire from the global north or the west to truly cut ties with um, fossil fuel industry and the damaging you know, companies and mass corporation that are just pillaging the resources of the global south um, and then acting as if it's everybody's equal responsibility to um, clean up the mess. Um, and there's an overall just lack of urgency, I think, um, in terms of how we react, you know, all the targets are 2030 or later and uh, it's not good enough. Like people are literally losing their homes, sea levels are rising. Uh, whole islands are disappearing um, and while we get to kind of sit back and take this uh, slow incremental approach to climate change when it's not you know it's not an incremental issue it's already devastating people's lives right now um, so yeah I mean uh, their role in solving the problem should be huge but uh, sadly uh, right now it, it isn't and it isn't good enough yeah, and I think we all agree with that. Um, Anna, would it be okay for to pass on to you? Sort of maybe you've spoken about the existing agreements, but maybe some more like concrete things. What policies could change? What um, laws could get enacted? Yeah, definitely. I think in in terms of concrete steps, we know yeah, the global north is we're sort of 
hurtling towards this ecological you know disaster and it's clearly countries you know in the global south that are, are facing and already are facing you know the gravest consequences of this so what it could look like um um, and who is, is responsible here is we, we know it's a global problem climate crisis is that requires really global solution but the but the bottom line the the countries responsible really are high emitting nations um countries uh, in the global north and so what we can do i think and we, what we saw at comp 26 is really loss and damage finance so i think that is a really important area um so to explain, to rewind a little bit, loss and damage is really um, a term that refers to like the unavoidable impacts of the climate crisis from say like mega storms, wildfires, droughts, and sea level rise that can't be avoided by say adaptation or mitigation efforts such as like reducing emissions, stuff of that sort. So these um, loss and damages really impact people's lives, livelihoods, infrastructure. Um, and we know that these impacts also contribute to displacement. So in the immediate um, by 2030, really the estimated um, needs for, for displacement and, and for loss and damage finances between 290 and 580 billion dollars in US dollars um, in developing countries alone. So the responsibility here really fits squarely with wealthy um, you know, nations as well as fossil fuel corporations. So um, we know that the United States, UK, the EU are really avoiding dealing with this because they know that they you know, can be legally liable for, right, for the historic um, greenhouse gas emissions as well as to vast compensation claims. So we're seeing um, other countries be more creative here and to, to know that even if we're not going to take action on a global scale, say the Barbados um, Prime Minister Mia Motley, she proposed a, a tax for fossil fuel corporations. So a 1% tax would lead to around $70 billion um, in loss and damage finance. So there's these other more creative ways that we're trying to tackle it as we see these repeated you know, climate conferences and nothing has happened or you know, very little has happened, but there's been some action, but it's very slow. So being creative around what it can look like um, for, for folks uh, in the Global South to lead on this, right? If we're going to repeatedly fail. And so it's really important to think of these creative solutions as well as for folks in the global north to, to really push our, our governments as much as we can to take action on these things. Thank you. And Andre, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just a couple of brief things. That was, yeah, really, really comprehensive and really interesting. I learned so much there. Um, and I think, yeah, I would just agree that um, it is, yeah, it's about rather than putting the amount of money i think it's what is it I've got here, 420 million euros a year that the um frontex the eu border agency spends each year um and that's with that's the set budget but then they have extra expenditure and stuff and that could go a long way towards um providing some of the kind of um, mitigation and using that it's always this we don't have the money approach but when they're spending this much money on trying to keep the problem out we could if we had the right intentions use that money towards actually solving the solving the problems and creating a better world for everyone rather than just building walls so that we don't have to see the bad stuff that's going going on elsewhere um and yeah i think i think yeah um not too many other uh, bits to, to add on to to other than that other than yeah we do require like quite a significant system change um and yeah, a big part of that is dismantling the border industry um, and ideally moving towards a no borders future, um, which is the dream. But in the, it's very hard to fully imagine what that would look like because there's so many contingent factors. So in the short run, we need to move towards things like a world where there's no border violence, which we can all agree there should be no violence attached to people trying to move from point A to point B, no matter what the, the circumstances are. And so trying to demilitarize the borders, trying to um, have other means of, I mean, it's all that, there's so many interlinked things, but getting rid of the like carceral culture and the idea that people should be like locked up for these things whilst awaiting the, the deportation or whatever. And um, even the ideas of deportation is just, yeah, absurd in a lot of ways. But so yeah, there's a lot of concrete manifestations of, of the bordering and, and stuff that we can be tackling to try and help people. Um, in the, in the short term whilst we move towards the kind of system changes and policy changes that we need in the long term. So um, following from that, we've got all these big ideas and uh, sort of a no border future and getting rid of sort of capitalism, realism, and that's the only way forward. Um, what, how can we make this happen? What as students can people do to enact change? Um, would it be okay if I started with you, Anna? What can people, sure. individual students, whoever, can do to make change? 
Yeah, definitely. I think solidarity is, is always important, you know, with, with marginalized communities, with folks in the global south that are, are calling for different actions, whether that be, say, debt cancellation. So thinking about changing, you know, climate finance is very voluntary at the moment. So what does it look like for that to push that to be mandatory and obligatory? Um, and a lot of currently like loans are like our loans to, to developing countries and countries in the global south are they you have to pay back those loans. So like, what does it amount? How can you shift that, right? To, to not have to pay back a loan to, oh, I need to go help my community rebuild. And the, the Global North is like, oh, you need to repay back that in, in a few years. So what does it look like to shift finance and what that looks like and, and be in solidarity with folks? From a sort of organizational perspective on our site, I think um, we have a few um, actions that you all can, can take part on. Um, we have a new campaign called Frontlines, which is like a hub for action on climate-induced displacement. I'll drop all these links in the chat in a, a moment. So that that's a really great one. We have different um, trainings that we link to on um, sort of refugee law and what what it, how you can support there, um, different volunteering as well as what you can how you can support climate refugees. Um, other than that, we're gearing up for COP27. So if you all do different fundraisers, things like that, definitely welcome the support there. And then lastly, if you all are planning any advocacy actions that we can promote as well, um, we would love to promote those on our channels um, to, to try to lift up you know, what you all are doing as well. So just in those different ways, I think just being as active as, as you all can possibly be on this and coming to things like this is, is helpful as well. Thank you. And Faith, is it okay if I go to you? Yeah, so I think it's always a kind of question that I think is really difficult because, you know, you're talking about corporations and uh, and governments and their lack of accountability. And then you're kind of looking at things on maybe a more individual level and it can seem kind of an impossible task, I guess. But there are definitely small lifestyle changes that we can all um, make without too much uh, sacrifice. You know, I'm not going to list them because I think everybody knows them by now. Um, but I would also say that, uh, you know, trying to apply knowledge and skills to the real world. So for students, especially who are studying um, specific areas, I think this is kind of like a good example of what um, Andre has done with his kind of academic skills is like applying them um, to the real world or applying those ideological ideas to the real world. Um, having discussion groups like these and just talking to um, family and friends who may not, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm talking about my parents now who just kind of watch the news and don't really, you know, read anything else about these kind of issues. So maybe sometimes linking up those issues and explaining how, you know, war is related to climate change um, and how borders uh, related to climate change uh, it is quite, can be quite helpful and it's spreading those ideas around um, if there's a particular issue or if somebody you know in your community is going to be deported like email your MP try and make take like political action and political change um, go to protests uh, I don't think like protests should ever be underrated and uh, you know we've seen some huge ones uh, for climate change and uh, yeah I, I don't think they should be underrated at all like I know you get people who say Direct action doesn't work, but it definitely does. And uh, the more people, the better. Thank you. And Andre, would you be happy to talk about some of the stuff People and Planet does? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah, firstly, I would second everything Faith said there. Um, absolutely spot on. Yeah, we need to do what we can to act local. And there's a lot of things that, yeah, not echo chambers, but yeah, we can often have this idea that these links are very clear and, and that it's very understandable, but yeah sometimes people do need that just to take some time to just explain things to people that haven't been exposed to the same media um and as Anna said I think yeah the key word is just solidarity like doing what you can to understand what what migrants and what people affected by this want us to do and whatever city you're in I can almost guarantee that there are there are migrants and refugees organizing there already and try and link up with them see what they need see what support you can give them just show out um but yeah at people and planet um yeah, our, our organising is very much based around sort of using the privileges that we have as students in the UK um, and using that position to try and break down the system in the ways that we can. And so our current main migrant justice campaign, uh, Divest Borders, is essentially trying to, because, yeah, BAE and Circo and Mighty don't really care what refugees think and don't care to a large extent what we think but universities really do and universities 
like public opinion is the currency of a university in a large extent. And so we have the power as students and as people in the UK to put pressure on public bodies like universities. Um, and they have a large influence on the way that some of these things work. So the Diverse Borders Company targets, we've identified 60 companies that we see as constitutive of the border industry as it operates mainly in the UK, but also in the EU and on the US-Mexico border and various places around the world, a lot of these companies will just get involved wherever they can make the money um, sort of thing. And so we've identified these 60 companies and then the campaign seeks to get universities to remove all investments and partnerships from these companies um, and commit to never forming partnerships or investments with them again, um, because unis do have like good amounts of money, like hundreds of millions invested in companies like BAE, like Serco, like uh, British Airways that, that perpetrate, uh, perpetrate all of this border violence. And then a lot of unis have specific contracts with them to provide services. services. So like KCL has a contract with Serco um, to provide educational services to their pe people that then go off and be border guards and staff places like Yarlswood and horrible places like that. Um, Durham have contracts with Mighty, um, stuff like that, and Mighty run a lot of the, the detention centres. And so, yeah, as students, one thing that we can do, and one thing that people in Planet have had a lot of success in the past, is in pressurising unis to divest from fossil fuels. And I think we've got 73 commitments, fossil-free uh, commitments now, which I think is 41% of the world, worldwide university uh, divestment commitments. And so essentially diverse borders is applying that same logic and that same tactics where we've had so much success and applying it to the border industry so that we can um essentially do what do what we can to remove money and funding from this industry but mainly to delegitimize it because universities are thought leaders and often people look to universities for the ideas of what's acceptable in society and if universities are taking a stance against these companies and saying we don't want any part with border violence Hopefully, the precedence is, yeah, that there's been a lot of success with, I'm talking a lot here, but in Australia, they managed to essentially stigmatise the running of the offshore detention camps that they were running in Nauru um, and uh, Papua New Guinea, which were absolutely horrific. And essentially, campaigners managed to create such a stigma around taking on those contracts. And they were going to the extent of like literally turning up at like the country clubs and like doing people as they were like walking over with their posh mates to go and play golf or whatever. But we're creating such a stigma around these industries that nobody was willing to take up the contracts. And the, the Australian government was still trying to run these centers, but no companies would take it on. So they just had to close them. And our aim is essentially to try and create that same kind of stigma around the border industry in the UK and beyond. And so, uh, I'll drop a couple of links in the chat, but we're actually running an open workshop uh, on Thursday, 4 to 5.30 on Zoom, participatory and open to all students across the UK um, to come and learn more about the campaign. So I'll drop the, the registration link for that and the website where you can find out more about the campaign. And I'd love to see some of you guys there and get involved in that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that'll, that'll do for that. Brilliant. Thank you. And we'll make sure to share that um, event. Um, so from sort of individual actions, as Faith talked about, uh, the more specific stuff of climate refugees, there's lots of stuff that people can do to help and to change people's minds. Um, I don't know, any closing statements would people like to add their social medias? Um, Anna, would you like to add climate refugees and just say a final thing? You don't have to. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I, I put the, the socials are in the chat, so we got it there. But yeah, I think that um yeah no i think this is like i said earlier it is a global problem that really requires all of us to take action and so i think no action is too small i think often folks are very overwhelmed by you know the climate crisis is huge right and where do you fit in and i think just finding what small area fits whether it's in your local community or it's acting um a, on a sort of supporting a community say in Afghanistan like what that looks like I think just taking any action you can I think is really critical and, and pushing your government in any way that you can to, to support folks um I'll leave it there but it's it was awesome to chat with everyone I'm excited for questions Anna or oh, sorry Faith do you have any closing statements on your socials um yeah I was just going to say uh at Voice Wales we're always looking for people to um you know, send in their stories, but also opinion pieces or comment or analysis pieces. 
like if there's any students here you're obviously doing a lot of writing um and uh, and you all have an interest in these topics so please feel free to like send pictures or um you know even if you're not a writer or a journalist like it doesn't matter like we're keen to hear from anybody um so please drop us a message i'll put like the editor email in the chat as well um but yeah i think uh yeah i always find like climate change to be really kind of a uh, daunting and horrible issue but to having these discussion groups is is always like makes me feel like it's uh, a little bit more manageable i guess or there is kind of more hope out there so thank you for putting this um this panel on albert and matilda thank you for coming um and andre any closing statements we we will share your um the workshop at the end yeah no that'd be great but yeah no, i just i just echo that i think yeah i just find these spaces so so um inspiring and i think yeah because a lot of the work that i do is particularly around bordering and, and migration and stuff um there's a lot of climate stuff going on at people and planet but i don't usually get to sort of discuss it in such a climate focus and it is something that is really important to me and so it's yeah really nice to just have this intersection of the topics where it was just space to, to discuss these and hear from yeah we like both um anna and faith have yeah i've learned so much tonight and yeah definitely going to be following up on your work and, and keeping in touch and yeah it's just been yeah really good and um yeah thanks a lot for, for having us brilliant thank you so much for um coming along i'm going to hand over to Matilda for any questions um yeah over to Matilda. yeah so yeah to all attendees now if you'd like to drop any questions into the chat for the speakers um we've got a few um just around kind of as andre mentioned kind the militarization of borders so could you kind of explain in more specific detail what the current border policy looks like for climate migrants? Um, you could, yeah, I guess mention that of the UK if, if that's. Um, yeah. Sorry, was that was that to me? I... Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you <made> a... <laughs> sorry. Just I was about just the current border policy. Sorry. <laughs> current um, the around the policies. Um, what well, sorry uh, so in relation to climate migration climate migrants so what kind of what does that look like uh, currently in the uk if, just for students who might not be aware of that or um, um i must say the the actual state of the policy isn't too much my understanding because with the divest borders policy uh, campaign we're essentially not taking it as a given but sort of trying to pressurize the system without relying on changing pretty patel's mind essentially which is not not the easiest thing and like yeah it's a, it's not a case that can really be won on uh, moral grounds there when there's so much um material um and capital behind this project and so i think this this campaign is more trying to attack it through those those lenses which i don't yeah, which means I haven't actually gone into the policy too much on our undoing borders campaign, which is about pushing the hostile environment out of universities. I have a good understanding of essentially how how migrant students are affected by the Home Office's um, student sponsorship guidelines in the way that they force the, um, the universities to collect academic monitoring data, the the, um, the differences in, in fees that are charged for overseas and um, home students and the, the different tone that's taken by the university towards them. And we we try and combat that with our Undoing Borders campaign. Um, but yeah, the, the, the diverse borders is much more focused on the, the border industry, which essentially yeah, causes violence on, on a number of avenues. And I suppose I can slightly expand on that if that would be helpful. Um, or I can stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah, if you could just expand on that. Yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. So, so we, we sort of characterize the border industry as five separate sort of subcategories and so the one that most people would think of would be the sort of physical border security and control and that's things like the the guards with batons um the people like pulling apart um camps in calais the the boats turning migrants back in the channel um all of this and that's a lot of the people the main in the main players in that industry are the big war companies bae lockheed martin airbus um etc but then um we also target deportation, which we see as violence full stop. It's not about if you're being deported, de deported to a place where you're at risk of X or Y or Z, like ripping somebody from their family is a violent act. 
any time. And so any company involved in that we're targeting. Uh, detention, similarly, it's not about child detention. It's not about detention in squalid conditions or indefinite detention. Any detention um, as a res uh, just on the basis of your migration status or having traveled uh, across a certain line is violence. And so we're targeting anybody complicit in that. And that includes, as I say, a lot of companies that are like staples on campus, like Mighty, Circo, G4S, who provide a lot of campus security, a lot of the, the um, catering staff, all these kind of things. Um, and then it's also, there is a horrendous and large growing uh, border surveillance industry where they're funneling huge amounts of money in, into new technologies and applying new technologies to essentially persecuting migrants. And so we've got things like facial recognition, um, and AI databases, um, biometric indices being taken and data databases that are sp uh, spread across the whole of Europe. Um, there's two new technologies that I think it's Elbit, the um, Israeli firm have developed that allows them to essentially hack phones and take back uh, essentially the entire history of the, the phone's usage and all its GPS locations and all messages sent, even things that have been deleted. Um, and so there's huge amounts of money being put into these companies that we're trying to resist. And then there's loads of companies that you just wouldn't, like people like Microsoft and um, Amazon run huge databases for Border Force. Fujitsu um, use their camera technology to, to do facial recognition for border stuff. Uh, Experian do credit checks on migrants um, that prevents people getting into the country. And so essentially, yeah, it, it's such a wide nebulous, network of companies that we're trying to resist. Um, but I hope that gives an idea of sort of how it's all put together and how it kind of operates and some of the key players. But if you check out the Divest Borders Action Guide on our website, we go into this in a lot of depth. We've got the, the full list and stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think as attendees have been saying in the chat, like this is a really great explanation. And yeah, thank you for going into that. I think it's kind of like shocking to see like the role that private companies have uh, to play in all of this. Um, but yeah, I think, one of the questions we have for Faith, um, I think you mentioned it briefly earlier, kind of the linkages between the climate crisis and the crisis that's currently happening in Afghanistan. If you wanted to maybe delve into that a bit more, um, that'd be great. You're on mute. Okay. Sorry, I just said I was gonna shuffle my notes and do a bit of a Boris Johnson kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I one thing I wanted to touch upon actually is obviously um, the UK government's uh, scheme to bring more uh, Afghans over to the UK. Um, but obviously, this falls drastically short. They're only allowing five thousand in the first year, um, and then I think twenty thousand um, for the rest of the scheme. But between two thousand and eight and 2019, the UK deported um, 15,755 people um, back to Afghanistan. Um, so yeah, I think, I just, I feel like there's just this complete lack of accountability over their kind of, uh, the UK, uh, the UK's role in the uh, occupation of Afghanistan over the last 20 years, and then, you know, uh, claiming to be helping uh, Afghan um, refugees now, which um, again, it's only certain people, so uh, women and children, and then obviously people who worked for the British government were prioritized. Um, so this means families are being broken up and there were all kinds of issues with, with um, Afghans in the hotels um, over here. So like a five-year-old boy died after falling from um, a hotel window uh, due to just complete lack of uh, health and safety. Um, yeah, so sorry, I've talked more about the, uh, the, the refugee side of things rather than the climate um, part of the question. I don't know if you want me to talk about that a little bit, but um, yeah, obviously, I just feel like right now Afghanistan is faced with two battles. Obviously, there's a political one and then there's the, um, the climate crisis that they're, they're fighting. And uh, I also feel like the, the two intersect so much because obviously the the uh, US and the NATO occupation of Afghanistan for the last 20 years means resources have been completely directed into that. So climate change has been neglected. Um, so there's been these breakdowns of the ecosystem and, the, and 
uh, farmers have been completely neglected um, and they're now kind of faced with this uh, this complete lack of food security um, coupled with the political instability as well so we, like uh, I think I'm quoting people now who, who've been speaking to the media but they, they just feel like there's no way out as you can imagine um, I, I mean if people are selling their children then <laughs> Uh, it can't really get much worse, can it? So, um, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and yeah, just as a closing question, I think um, for Anna. Um, so, your organization is Climate Refugees, and um, this event was on climate migration. But I think kind of the terminology terminology around that. So, kind of climate migrants or climate refugees. What do people kind of refer to? Um, people who are displaced as a result of the climate crisis. Do you mind kind of going into that a little bit more, the differentiation? I know you've touched a little bit on the fact that it's not included within the 1951 Refugee Convention. Um, could you just expand a bit more on that, um, on that difference? Or, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah, I think as you just mentioned, you know, the convention didn't conceive, you know, climate change as a threat to human security, right? So, but we know that that reality is different now. So really climate can be akin to, to persecution for some communities, right? So whose dependency on land, on natural resources, on communities, say, in like the Northern Triangle um, in Central America who, you know, are reliant on agriculture and there's a bunch of droughts and so they're migrating to the US border and what does our border policy look like? So then, um, you know, how do you act on that? Are those folks refugees, are they migrants? What does that look like? So we know that, you know, climate, change is really disproportionately impacting communities you know, on the front lines here. Um, and it's increasingly also contributing to displacement of um, communities as well. So 90% of, of refugees today come from countries that are most vulnerable and least ready to adapt to climate change, right? So even though a lot of climate displacement is internal, that by no means you know, diminishes the, the protection needs here um, for folks. So for displaced populations and also the assistance that is required, you know, from the international community, we really need to also support communities. So understanding this, it's really, really critical for those legal protections to be there as well as financial assistance. So understanding it within this framework, that it, we're, it is a very politicized framework and understanding that folks do need these rights um, because we are, they're, you know, ending up on borders like the US border that's extremely militarized. So what does it look like for folks to actually have rights um, to be, and legal rights in particular, that isn't just, you know, sort of our general, you know, sort of human rights and thinking about that actual legal protections, and that's you can get that through under a refugee sort of understanding. Thank you so much. And I feel like yeah, we're just running over by a minute or so. So I think just as a closing kind of a message, yeah, thank you everyone for coming along. Um, thank you for incredible guest speakers as well for joining us today. Um, please do look into the links that they've posted on the chat, um, follow their work. Um, I'll be also putting into the chat just um, a short like, feedback form to take only a few minutes if you'd like to give us feedback on how the event went today, as well as the socials um, or handles should be there as well, if you want to continue following our work. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. See you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See ya. See you soon. Thank Thanks you. for coming.